now 31, we're back. We're gonna graph another rational function. It's um, one that we've seen a couple times in this section, but let's let's actually get its graph. So I'm gonna scale my, ax ax my axes, and I'm gonna label them also. All right, anytime it comes to graphing a function, start with the domain. And I, I would actually, even before that, factor anything that I could, but I can't factor either my numerator or denominator because they're already factored, so I don't have to really worry about that. Okay, but in terms of what zeroes out, let's start to work this. So for my denominator being zero, I get x equaling negative one, which means I can't plug negative one into this function. So I need to boot it from my domain. And while I'm here, right, I, anytime you have an issue with your domain, it will either turn into a vertical asymptote or a hole, and we haven't talked about holes yet, so let's just clear out if this is a vertical asymptote. Yes, negative one zeroed out my denominator, but it does not zero out my numerator. Or another way of saying that is negative one only zeroes out your denominator, and when that's the case, you have a vertical asymptote, and I wanna write the vertical asymptote up in the form x equals a number, because it is a vertical line. And as soon as I start finding traits, I put them on my graph, Otherwise, it just gets a little too overwhelming for me. So let me go ahead and write out the line x equaling negative one. Now I'll dot it, it's not actually part of my graph, but it's a boundary that my function can't pass. Okay. All right, so let's keep on going. For x-intercepts, anytime you wanna find the zero of a function, you wanna let y equal zero. Well, another way of saying that is when is 4x minus two over x plus one equal to zero? The only way for a fraction to be zero is if the numerator is zero. It's the only way you'll ever have a fraction be zero. So when is 4x minus two equal to zero? Well, that's when x is equal to one half. So I have an x-intercept at 1 half comma zero. Let me go put that on my graph. Here's my x-intercept, okay? Now I find a y-intercept when I let the function itself, I'm sorry, when I let x equal zero. So let's do f of zero. That would be zero minus two over zero plus one. So I'm thinking negative two, but it is also an ordered pair. So I'm gonna write that up as the form zero, negative two. So one, two, there we go. All right. Now let me scooch this up just a bit so we can get everything in view, or hopefully everything in view. All right, when it comes to end behavior, let's talk about the degree in our numerator versus the degree in our denominator. Oops. The degree in our numerator is one, because it's a linear factor and the degree in our denominator is also one. And whenever you have your degree in your numerator equal to your degree in your denominator, you wanna look at the ratio of the lead terms and specifically the coefficients of the lead terms. So here are my two lead terms. The coefficient here is four, the unsaid coefficient here is one. So I'm going to have a horizontal asymptote and it's gonna be the ratio of four over one, which is just four. All right, so I have a horizontal asymptote at y equaling four. I'm gonna scooch this back down so I have some room to graph it. And let me go ahead and graph out y equaling four here. All right, so one, two, three, four, there we go. All right, so if we just wanna label these just so we're keeping track, this is y equaling four, and this one was x being equal to negative one. All right, so with that, we need to graph our function. And here's where we kind of run out of steam algebraically. We, we don't exactly know what it looks like, but we have some idea. When you're coming up on asymptotes, whether they're horizontal or vertical, you're headed towards them, they're boundary lines. So my function's either headed up this way or up this way, I'm not sure. 
where it's headed flat to y equals 4 above it or below it. Not sure, right? So I'm either above it or below it. And again, left or right. One of those two. So those are my options. Now, I see two ordered pairs here. And these two ordered pairs can help me figure out at least the right half of the graph. I know these have to connect up and I must be increasing, right? And if I'm increasing, I must get closer and closer to that horizontal asymptote, which means I know that coming this way, that's my function. And then between these two choices, coming down to x equals negative one, either on the right or the left of it, I must have been on the right of it because my graph is over here on the right of it. Like that, okay. So my next guess, the next thing I have to work through is which, which half is the, which, I should say, which shape is the left half? Is it the top part here or is it the bottom part here? Now, before we go use our graphing calculators, I just wanna remind you about your basic reciprocal function, right, your toolkit function. We remember talking about this when it's your toolkit function, it's upper half and lower half, or I should say left half is below the x-axis, right half is above the x-axis. Now we've shifted and stretched this function. We've done some transformations, but just keeping that toolkit function in mind, maybe you can start to guess, am I gonna have the upper half or the lower half? And if you're not sure, then go to your calculator, right? Here's where technology can help you. So let me clear this out and type in with protected parentheses, right? I always wanna protect those binomials. So four X minus two, divided by x plus one. And then if I hit zoom six, I can see it's the top half, right? And there's that bottom half that's lining up with what I got. If I want some ordered pairs to help me, I can go into my table. It looks like I have negative 5.5. Actually, I'll do the whole numbers, negative four, six, and negative three, seven. Ooh, and even negative two, 10. So let me put those in there. So I'm gonna erase these arrows because I know what I got now. All right, so we've got negative two, and then I was up here at 10. It looks like I have negative three, seven, um, negative four, six. Let me make sure, one, two, three, four, four, five. Yeah, this is right, okay. So I'm gonna sketch this in. All right, so the graph on my paper is looking a lot like the graph on my calculator, if you want, you have the option, you could type in the vertical, excuse me, the horizontal asymptote, and you'll see it cuts your graph, right? Okay, so I only have one more trait. I need to address the range. So let me scooch this up, right? And let's see if we can figure out the range for this function. All right, so I can see my down arrow here, right? Down forever, I'm going all the way from negative infinity, and then I get close to four, but you'll see my function doesn't actually cross the horizontal asymptote, which is different from example five, where we did have a piece of our graph that crossed the x-axis, or sorry, crossed the horizontal asymptote, which happened to be the x-axis. All right, so I'm going negative infinity to four. I hop on the other side of four and go all the way up to positive infinity. So for this particular example, when we talk about our range, we're gonna say our range is from negative infinity to four, and then four to infinity, okay? So there's your second example of graphing a rational function. All right, so we're gonna try example seven next, and we're just gonna keep on graphing these things. All right, I'll see you in a bit, bye.